Hi, I'm Emily Starikoff. Uh, it's lovely to meet you all. So um, I'm currently um, on the civil service fast stream. So um, the fast stream has several different strands to it. And I'm on and what's, I'm called, on what's this, called this. this oh, I'm getting echo. OK, it stopped. Um, I'm on the science and engineering strand of the fast stream. Um, so I've spent a year working in the Department of Health and Social Care. Um, and then now I'm on secondment to the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority, um, which is the UK regulator of all fertility clinics and um, embryo research. Um, prior to starting on the science and engineering fast stream, I did a PhD in clinical biochemistry. Um, so I was at Queen's College um, and my PhD was based out at Addenbrooke's um, in the Institute of Metabolic Sciences. So um, it was into diabetes, essentially. Um, and then prior to my PhD, I did my undergrad in the University of Manchester um, and I studied biochemistry uh, in Manchester. Um, and um, during my time in Manchester, I spent a year out in industry working at AstraZeneca and their discovery sciences team. Um, in terms of uh, work experience, I did during my um, time in Cambridge um, that kind of helped me get into policy. Um, I would say the main thing I did was the Cambridge University Science and Policy Exchange Society, CUSPI. Um, so I imagine some of you on this call are already aware of it, but happy to talk more about that as we go on. Hi everyone. Yeah, uh, so my name is Jess Lister. I am an Associate Director in the Education team at a policy consultancy called Public First. Uh, I do a mix of policy, strategy work and public opinion work uh, that is all quite politically focused and aims at trying to get organisations to think more about uh, who their policy is impacting and how to do it better, um, which is all, all quite good fun. I primarily work with uh, universities in the UK and in the US and with um, sort of third sector and charitable organisations primarily in the UK. Uh, I did history at Emmanuel. I graduated in 2017. Um, I had no sort of policy intentions as an undergrad that wasn't what I thought I was going to do I thought I was going to go off and be a teacher uh, and accidentally ended up landing in policy um, I did a little bit of work in the admissions team at Cambridge first uh, ended up in the policy team for the university and sort of went into consultancy from there so a little bit of a, a sort of less well thought out route through um, and in between all of that, I did a part time master's uh, at Birkbeck in education and policy uh, once I'd worked out that that's what I liked. Uh, happy to talk about any and all of that further this evening. I'm Jose. I'm Spanish. I graduated from Cambridge in 2019. Um, I did an MPhil in modern European history there. Uh, but now I'm working for Grayling, a public affairs consultancy here in Brussels. Um, so essentially we work for clients in different sectors. Me specifically, I work in the transport and technology sectors mostly. Um, we advise them essentially on, on EU regulation, how the EU's um, laws affect them, how, what the EU is planning to do. And we try to represent them before the EU institutions and try to get their voice heard um, within the um, the EU uh, landscape. Um, yeah, uh, essentially, as you probably know, the EU is one of the biggest regulators in the world. So many sectors, many companies, uh, trade associations are very interested in what's happening here. And yeah, we try to to, uh, to offer our clients uh, yeah, in intelligence and then try also to, to put them in touch with the policymakers to help them under understand and communicate with them. Um, yeah, regarding my uh, how I got here, uh, as as Jess, I during my my studies I wasn't really thinking about about going into policy or public affairs because I studied history, so I was also thinking more about academia or teaching. Uh, but after graduation, I was also interested in this and. Well, it's a long story, but I first did some internships here in Brussels um, for the institutions and also in some NGOs. Um, yeah, working in public affairs, and uh, finally I I ended up in this uh, yeah in the consulting world, which is pretty interesting. You touch on upon very different sectors, and so yeah, happy to to discuss more later. And my name is Julie uh, Dumbo. I graduated in 2018. Um, in uh, politics and sociology under HSPS um, from Lucy Cavendish College. Uh, I work in, I currently work in the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero um, in the UK government where 
I, I work in policy specifically sort of as head of uh, partnerships for the Breakthrough Agenda, which is um, sort of a framework of, of international collaboration around um, industrial decarbonisation, um, sort of coming out of the UK's COP26 uh, presidency. So it's sort of a, a yeah, a programme working um, to bring countries together and to sort of ensure that countries collaborate uh, globally to um, to reduce emissions from sort of key industrial sectors. Before that, I did a couple of other sort of things within the, in sort of the climate climate space, um, such as working on climate and trade. Um, and I also worked on the Chris Skidmore review, which was a sort of a big uh, government. Um, what's it called? Like government uh, like independent review commissioned by the government, uh, led by Chris Gitmore, MP, now former MP, I believe. Um, and um, before that, I worked on uh, EU exit negotiations uh, within the science and innovation space. So I've been working in the civil service since uh, 2019. Um, I did also did a master's in EU politics uh, in at UCL, uh, graduating in 2019. So I went straight from my uh, undergraduate to to my master's and then into the civil service um, but yeah happy to to talk about any any of that um, as well as yeah what, what I did during my undergraduate degree and yeah how that helped me. Hi everybody my name is Kara Herricks obviously the accent betrays me as American um, I'm not a Cambridge alum but I did live in Cambridge for a bit so if you mention a popular takeout place I've probably been there um, I'm currently head of geopolitical risk analysis at PwC. My role is internal, meaning that I don't work with PwC's clients. Uh, my role involves looking at a scope of different types of risk, whether that's climate change and natural disasters, security issues, political economic issues, and making a recommendations to PwC or imposing policies on certain PwC firms about what we need to, to do to make sure we're protecting our assets and ensuring that we're continuing to deliver service. Prior to joining PwC, I worked in the corporate security outfit at Accenture, and before that, I worked in the U.S. intelligence community. Typically, when I engage with students or grad students, a lot of the topics I tend to discuss is, you know, what's the menu of job options in the geopolitical risk slash intel slash corporate security sphere? What skills do I need to break into this? Or if I'm transitioning from somewhere else, how do I break in? So happy to, to talk about any of those things or any other random questions you have. I'm Neve Buckingham. I currently work for the blood cancer charity Anti Nolan. I'm a policy and public affairs manager, so I mainly lead on the health research and policy that we do, and also on the influencing side, so um, lobbying the government, NHS and other stakeholders. Um, I've been doing this for a couple of years, and before that I've worked for other charities in the health space, um, so very happy to give that charity perspective. Um, before that, I actually worked for an MP in Parliament, um, which was an experience and um, at, I went to Cambridge. I did HSBS as well, so I guess perhaps a more typical route in, but I did do so, um, social anthropology as my um, specialism and I went to Robinson, graduating in 2018. So yeah, as I mentioned, I currently work for Anthony Nolan. Um, before that, I worked for Sea Rider, which is a hospice charity. Um, and then before that, I was doing a graduate scheme, um, which is called Faith in Politics. And so that's really how I got my main experience. So through that scheme, I worked as a parliamentary assistant um, for an MP in the House of Commons. And the scheme is nine months and it's quite holistic. So um, on top of the um, work placement that we do, you also do some part time study in um, policy and you also get to have um, lots of networking opportunities and things like that. So there's like a cohort and we all do slightly different placements. Um, so some are based in parliament, um, some are based in charities and one is based in education. Um, so we'd recommend um, looking that up if that's of interest. Um, because I think it's really hard to get work experience um, or a job in Parliament if you don't have personal connections. Um, and I personally didn't. So I did think that um, the odds were sort of stacked against me. So I was really grateful to have that graduate scheme. 
Um, I also took the initiative to look into doing work experience um, sort of in my own time, so volunteering. Um, so through that, I decided to sign up to become the campaign's ambassador for Cancer Research UK. Um, so this is a role that um, anyone can apply for. And essentially, you're just sort of championing cancer researchers, campaigns and um, public affairs activity by lobbying your own constituency MP and by attending um, like parliamentary drop-ins, things like that. So I think that's quite a good way to get experience and I'm sure lots of other charities would offer something similar. Um, and then whilst at university, um, so I was quite involved with Cambridge Hub, which some of you might be aware of, um, particularly if you're interested in the sort of voluntary sector and um, space. So through that, I did an internship, which was with a social enterprise called Transitions, um, which was working in the area of um, refugee rights which was, was something that I was personally very interested and passionate in. Um, so that was a six week placement that I did in between, I think, my second and third years. Um, so that, again, was a really a useful way of um, building up that experience and also understanding for me what kind of areas, both like topic areas, but also the kind of organisation that I wanted to work for. Um, so you did have to apply for that and it was a process of um, application to Cambridge Hub specifically. Then um, they match you with a relevant organisation and you go for an interview process for that. Um, and incidentally, I was also part of the Cambridge Child Society, so I was vice president, um, which again, I think was um, showed to have like that on your CV or personal statement or whatever to show that you have had like a long-standing interest, I think, in this um, field um, is really important so to show that you're being sort of authentic and passionate about it. Um, I was also involved in more, um, I guess, sort of run of the mill activities in Cambridge. So I was access officer at my college um, and I was part of FEMSOC and I did lots of volunteering at various initiatives such as Jimmy's Homeless Shelter in Cambridge. And I think that I know that a lot of employers during interviews is really useful to have that experience to draw on, particularly on um, things like Jimmy's, which weren't university affiliated. Um, so I think it's helpful to have to show that you really have um, devoted a lot of your spare time to this um, and that you genuinely do believe in the course, um, I'd say is really helpful. And I think that sadly, um, the volunteering field in Cambridge as a city, um, they have lots of opportunities, but perhaps not quite much with the level of interest from students. And I think particularly in terms of their divide sometimes it can feel between um, the wealth of the university and then the city. I think for me personally, that was something that I was really passionate about getting involved in. Um, so I can't evangelize more about that. Uh, yeah, so did I do work experience during my undergraduate? The answer is yes. Uh, I was a full time student, a part time intern and a part time worker at like a pet store or a gym, you know, make that spending money. And you're thinking, Kara, the math's not mathing. You can't be all of those things at once. Um, and my answer to that is I skipped a lot of class. Uh, so the trade off at the time was I'm willing to take a hit on my academic grades somewhere between, you know, eight and five percent of my overall grade to gain work experience. And all my work experience, I knew that I wanted to work in international relations slash international affairs. I did a mix of government agency, NGO, consultancy, think tank work, um, and it was by far the best early career decision I have made. When I graduated with my degree, I had two years of consecutive internship experience that put me ahead of my peer group. And that has only compounded both in terms of work opportunity and salary going forward. So if you're not sure about what you wanna do, do internship experience and figure it out. If you're sure about what you want to do, dive into it. Um, it will most certainly pay off. The, what I can't stress enough is how you talk about your internship experience, both in interviews and on your CV, is the most important skill that you will carry forward. I know the Cambridge Career Services offers you resume building skills, but there's also a responsibility on you when you're doing that work experience to ask good questions. So what I see a lot when I'm looking at CVs is, oh, I, I did an internship and I wrote six reports. What I'm thinking is, that's great. So what? Did those reports 
change someone's mind? Did they give first mover advantage because you create a sense of urgency? So ask questions when you're in the role and immediately after the role about the work and the impact that you had while you were in that role. I think I'll definitely echo the thing about prioritizing getting some sort of experience as opposed to just studying. I think I guess that was my experience at Cambridge was that you know, there's a lot of focus on on, on studying and, and, you know, you're constantly surrounded by these um, academics that all need their top grades in order to get to where they are. But I think realistically, like, if the choice is between getting a first and no work experience and no volunteer experience or getting a 2-1 and having some sort of extracurricular experience, um, I think at least in like the policy space that I work in, I think the preference would be getting a 2-1 and having some sort of extracurricular experience on the side. Um, I, yeah, that, that would be, I, I see some nods across the, <laughs> across the board, but I think, I think that, that for me is definitely something I want, I want to highlight. Um, so what did I do to get relevant work experience? I was actually looking um, looking through my sort of personal statement for the first civil service job to just see what exactly I'd been doing and what I, I highlighted in that personal statement. Um, and I so so I was uh, quite active within my JCR. I was JCR president for for a while. Did uh, social events and stuff like that. Um, so I highlighted that sort of the experience got I got through that. I. I also um, worked on a policy project with the Wilberforce Society. I don't know if that's still a thing, but it's sort of like a student think tanky sort of um, work at Cambridge, which, um, yeah, I also highlighted and, and I thought was really helpful and really useful to sort of utilise some of the academic skills into something that feels a bit more like a real life problem, which is sometimes, you know, studying an undergrad, that's not always um, the problems that you deal with in most of your academic work. Um, and then I, during my master's degree, I also interned for an all party parliamentary group, um, which was, um, which was really, really fun and an interesting experience. I did, uh, I did a term. So I think in particular, because I guess my masters was slightly less intense than my undergraduate degree was that I had a bit more sort of breathing room to do this kind of like interning during term time um and yeah I think that that was uh, that was really great experience and sort of actually having responsibility for like comms and mailboxes and sending emails out to to everyone and communicating with MPs and and, and things like that um and then I've also highlighted a lot of like the paid work I did during the summer. I think both of my summers between all of the different years of undergrad and between my undergrad and my master's, I was doing paid work um, either at home where my parents live or in um, in Cambridge working at summer schools and stuff like that. And I think at least in the civil service, like if you have a little bit of that policy exposure, either through sort of voluntary work or internship I think you could still also just utilize a lot of sort of paid work experience to to sort of draw out things you've been doing you know if you've been working in a pub you know how to deal with difficult people sometimes or you know the importance of teamwork and you can manage your time and things like that as so I think you know having having some relevant policy experience helps but I don't think you need a, a full CV of like relevant on paid internship, I really think that there is a lot to be said for like just a working average uh, minimum wage jobs in over the summer. Me, in terms of uh, working during uh, my studies, I did do some uh, some internships, but they were more related to to what I was studying at the time, which was history. So I I worked uh, for a month during summer at a museum. I took part in some archaeological excavations, but this is less relevant, at least for for policy. Well, it's always relevant to say that you 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 got involved in the things that you did, were you were interested in. It's always uh, a matter of how, as as uh, Cara was saying, as a uh, matter of how to um, how to sell these things, how to present them. It's always important. But uh, in terms of how I, of how I got uh, into this job, uh, so uh, after graduation in 2019, um, at first, yeah, I, as I said, I, I was interested in going to academia, but I realized it wasn't really my my thing, and I was also interested in the in the EU and how how it affects the, the world in general. Um, so 
first I applied for a um, few internships um, here in Brussels. Um, well, the one I got in the end was an internship for the EU, but it was at the EU delegation to India, so in New Delhi. Uh, the EU has delegations which are more or less embassies in different countries. It was a very interesting experience where I learned a lot um, also about the EU's external relations, etc. Um, but after that, I still wanted to come to Brussels. Um, and in the end, I came, I first worked for a society of authors. So, um, uh, a trade association, let's say, or a group representing authors um, in Europe. And they were interested in things like copyright um, and uh, things like that, that the EU regulates. Um, and then for a while I worked for an NGO, uh, Fair Trade, and we were lobbying, we were doing advocacy um, for, for fair trade policies uh, in Europe. Um, and after that, I got into the, the consulting world. Uh, well, before I was at, a, at another consultancy working on tech issues, also in healthcare issues. And uh, yeah, last year I joined uh, this one. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, so essentially uh, there are, I think in Brussels, there are a lot of opportunities to, to start your career. There are a lot of internships at uh, the institutions first, but also at different trade associations, different companies that uh, that that provide, I think, good entry points. Um, from the, to get there, I guess you need uh, you need first to use some languages, I think, are always useful here, um, obviously, because of the, the institutions mostly work in, in English, but sometimes in French is always uh, useful. Um, yeah, and other than that, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, watching out for opportunities, uh, being a bit up to date with uh, with what's happening in the world. I think that's um, that's more or less uh, the, the, yeah, the first step. Yeah. I don't want to sort of repeat the really good advice that everyone else has said, but I want to think about, um, I think my route into a policy job was a little bit different and it might be helpful to people that are considering policy, but considering lots of lots of other things as well. Um, so I think the first thing to say is, is sort of any work experience skills that you can pick up, you know, while you're doing your degree are great, whether they are like prestigious internships or as, as Julie said, I think quite rightly, just, just sort of work or things in college or just just things you do that are sort of outside your degree like they're, they're never not going to be helpful the way that I have uh sort of worked through this um was to find a policy area that I was really passionate about so for me it's it's education policy um it's everything from sort of how schools work who decides what's in the curriculum and what's not how universities are funded how much do should tuition fees pay how much should we fund research um this is something that like I have always had a bit of an interest in uh, I did a lot of history of education uh, sort of uh, spawned out of of this thing that I I just you know sort of really nerdy way care about quite a lot uh, and and made it into a job so if if you are someone especially if you have a PhD or a postdoc it's going to be in a particular field there is nothing wrong with just sort of picking that up and and wandering into policy with it, whether that's sort of AI or health or whatever. Um, and then the other way of thinking about it is is just the skills you need to do good policy advocacy campaigning. They tend to be on the spectrum of you need to be a, a good researcher. Um, it helps enormously to be a good writer and an accessible writer. So what I mean by that is is not just being able to write a good academic paper, but being able to write a good 200 word paragraph on a really complicated topic that anybody could read and pick up and understand uh, with a huge amount of evidence and work that goes behind it. But but if anyone is thinking, you know, oh God, where am I going to go and find a sort of UN internship? Um, you know, I'm just really, really into AI. Like write something, start a blog, do it on LinkedIn, do it on Twitter. Like that is that is one of the best things you can do. And there's actually nothing stopping you. The barriers to entry on that are, are extremely low. It just, you know, you, it's up to you to write it, but you know, you don't have to apply to anything. Um, and then the other one is, is sort of, it, it's people. So I think sometimes people forget that a lot of our world, and I, I think it's it's true for everyone here, is um, not just the sort of topic policy area, but who you're trying to convince, who who holds the lever of power to change something, what policies am I going to need to change, what legislation, who am I going to need to talk to, how do I demonstrate that someone who doesn't care about this should care about this? Um, you know, we we use public opinion for that. A huge amount of our work is showing that 
policy change is sort of electorally and publicly popular. Um, there's lots of other tools um, to do that as well, but it, it, this is a sort of people job as well as a, a sort of research and policy job. Yeah, so I think um, kind of along the lines of what Jess was talking about, um, the the angle that I was approaching it from was that I am a scientist. I still am a scientist and will always refer to myself as a scientist, but I work in policy. Um, so when I figured out that I wanted to um, still use my science, but not actually be doing the science, um, I was trying to work out what kind of career paths would let me do that. Um, so um, at first, I actually thought I wanted to work in um, public engagement and kind of communication of science and outreach of science. So a lot of what I did during my um, undergrad and my PhD was framed around that. So I did um, a huge amount of public engagement work for my department. So that really echoes what Jess was saying. So I did things like explaining my PhD in a single sentence and teaching primary school kids about hormones with marbles and, you know, like so much public engagement work. Um, and I also, um, I think as Julie and Neve were saying, I was um, quite involved with all of the like various college things. So I was like on the MCR and um, did various things like that as well. Um, I also worked um, for the university's outreach team. So um, the university has, you can be an outreach ambassador where you will um, uh, host um, kind of um, students from around the country um, to try and make Cambridge undergrad a bit seem a bit more accessible to people so I think that was also really great experience and that was also leadership experience um, as well because you kind of lead these events and things like that. Um, I think the other thing that I found really useful which definitely isn't work experience but I think if you're thinking about kind of transitioning from a more scientific or academic career into the policy world is um, listening to podcasts. So I think a lot of being successful in applications and things like that is just kind of talking the talk and there definitely is a kind of different way in which people talk in the policy sector compared to the academic sector but there are so many good political and um, policy focused podcasts and I think that just kind of listening to those and and just kind of understanding what policy actually is um, and how people talk about it is also really useful to help you feel more confident when you're kind of looking at those sorts of job adverts and things like that. Yeah, so obviously one of the, the many hot topics in the room is the nexus between geopolitics and AI. And for all the nerds on the call, we're going to put a pin in that, so I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so given that this is a career call, I'm going to keep the, the conversation focused around how does AI impact my work day to day and how does AI impact how I behave as a hiring manager? So on the day-to-day -day aspect, very much echo Jessica's comment around AI is not smart enough to do my job yet. And there's a couple of different ways that's apparent. Um, one being it lacks the analytic rigor I would expect of someone looking at geopolitical risk events. It can't quite think through second and third order impacts to the extent that I would want it to. It doesn't know PwC well enough to make the so what or the implications part of that relevant. And the third kind of issue around AI, at least its current form, is it lacks the expository writing style that we would expect to see. I know Emily made a comment around the writing things are a little bit different in academia and policy, and I would add to that and in the business world too. So it's not quite there yet. Not going to see job loss from AI in the geopolitical slash risk slash intelligence world. Moving on to the second part of this is how does it impact me as a hiring manager? I wasn't around when the calculator was embedded, but I'm sure someone said, oh my God, no one's going to do math anymore. We have calculators. And I hear that around AI. Oh my God, no one's going to write anymore. They're just going to ask questions of chat GPT and wait for a response. Writing assessments are a key part of the interview process in, in my kind of job family. And the way that I integrate AI into that process is I expect applicants to use chat GPT, MMLs, all of that in kind of working towards finding a solution and, and crafting a response to the writing prompt. But when I meet with them, I'll say, okay, I see you've, you've answered the question. Let's say the question is, who's going to win the U.S. election in 2024 and what does that mean for PwC? And they, they have this beautiful written answer. When I'm in the interview with them, I'm going to say, okay, argue your second hypothesis. Explain to me why 
all the things you thought through and, and why this was not the answer and what the written response was. What I'm asking for here is I want to see that you have that critical mind that you can demonstrate analytical rigor, critical thinking, and ChatGPT is not doing it for you. So ChatGPT is kind of the new reality of how we do interviews, but don't expect that to ever replace skills that we're looking for. Um, and I'll, I'll pause there. I was only going to follow up on my my joke earlier, which is that I, I feel like at the minute chat GPT is, is like a slightly better Google, um, but I, I, I still win. Um, and at some point that will that will probably change. Um, but it's worth sort of particularly if you find yourself relying on it quite a lot in the application process, you can't outsource your thinking because that's that's the bit that will, will trip you up. Exactly as Cara said, um, when we interview, we are interviewing for people. I mean, we're, we're a consultancy as well, right? So we are we are interviewing for people that have interesting original ideas and can argue them quite well. Um, so exactly that. I think it's a great research tool. It's not quite um, a, a good sort of policy tool, um, but it'll, it'll get there. Yeah, so I'll just add very quickly that um, as a scientist working in policy, um, one of our kind of main roles is to um, support the formation of evidence-based policy and chat GPT cannot provide accurate citations. So I think, um, you know, you, you just you can't really use it basically because you need to ensure that any pol policy advice you're providing is actually properly cited. To add on to that, I think I don't really use it in my day to day job, apart from, you know, as Kara was saying, like as an advanced form of Google, if there's something that I'm like, oh, I wonder what we could do about that. I think, you know, ultimately working for the government, you're limited in what kind of tools you can use from like security perspective. So we're not really allowed, we're not allowed to use ChatGPT for anything that actually is not like publicly available information. So that's that's another thing. Um, that yeah sort of limit limits the use I find it can be useful for like just having a template if you're like oh I need to write a letter to this person and I can't be bothered to come up with a structure in this moment and then you know it will like generate a nice neat template and then you write it based off that I think that's the sort of day-to-day -day use I I have of it otherwise I don't really use it I would say that you can you start you start seeing more and more applications and personal statements that are written with chat gpt but i mean at least i'd like to think that that you can also like quickly recognize when the the language is a bit too sort of flowery and all over the place without actually saying much um that's usually a, a sign of of chat gpt no, I was just going to echo what Judy said before she said it about um, that. I think in job applications, you can still um, see who has used ChatGPT and are generally um, not rewarded for it. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to talk about transitioning from PhD into policy. Um, so I think the first thing I would flag is that um, quite so on the civil service fast stream, if you want to do the science and engineering one, you have to have a postgraduate degree. So that's kind of the baseline qualification anyway. Um, not necessarily a PhD, you could have a master's. Um, but yeah, I think that, um, you know, there's it's never too late to transition into policy. I think trying out academia is great. And I've learned loads of skills from my time in academia, which I now apply um, in my role in policy as well. Um, and I think kind of the like so many transferable skills you learn such as like critically reviewing like Jess was talking about earlier being able to write and being able to write for a lot of different audiences like these are all really essential skills that academia teaches you which are very very applicable to policy so I think if anything it's better to have done a bit more like there's absolutely no problem with doing a bit more in academia before you transition into policy and I think coming to policy with kind of new skills that you bring into the sector is really beneficial we as you say we we are quite a small sort of policy agency so so this is is really only reflective of, of of how we work but um we have hired people with phds and with postdocs and we've hired people sort of straight out of undergrad and often the starting point is is potentially not as different as you would imagine but the acceleration in the job if you've done a phd and a postdoc is much much quicker so so um, it, it's sort of that that sort of realisation that, you know, 
going from academia into any sort of, uh, sort of professional job, I think, is, is quite a, a tricky transition. But not to do both, not to overestimate and underestimate your skill set. So, so you will have an enormous amount of subject knowledge, an enormous amount of research knowledge. You're going to be great at managing your time. Uh, you're going to fairly quickly sort of pick up the the sort of corporate world and the way sort of just work works is different to the to the university sector compared to someone that's sort of uh, slightly more fresh faced and 21. Um, but that that sort of starting point and the training need uh, is often often sort of starts starts off the same. So uh, just that that sort of balance between like it it will be a transition to go from any sort of particularly if you're a postdoc and you've done sort of now by then six or seven or eight years in a university environment there is always going to be that switch but not to sort of you know some people still then underestimate the skills skills that they have yeah it's quite an interesting question um I guess I haven't really had that experience but I am considering um in the next few years moving away from the charity sector to diversify my career and I think the route I will probably take is it's quite hard to change both industry and the sort of like topic area at the same time so often it's um most people would do one or the other so you might stay for instance in the world of health but move from a charity to civil service or other than that you might um change from health to i don't know energy or something like that um but um there's definitely ways of getting experience which again are not sort of formal jobs so one way um which is quite accessible as well is becoming a trustee of a organization in the relevant area um and lots of organizations especially charities are really looking for young trustees um and the time commitment it can vary a little bit and i'm sure not all board meetings are the most interesting ways to spend your Thursday evenings but um often the time commitment isn't huge and it can be a really good opportunity to shape um the direction of organizations and i think you learn a lot about um strategy and um finance and planning and things like that through that experience as well um and it just shows that um you have it's just a track record of interest in that area and like an understanding of the issues of the day so i think that is also like a really easy um well maybe not easy but a, an accessible option for people to consider as well Yeah, just happy to come in on that point because I know I particularly have talked a lot about volunteering. Um, obviously Cambridge is tricky in that you can't, you're not supposed to take on paid work during term time, and that is quite limiting. And um, for me personally, um, I did have to earn every summer in order to make it sort of through the year, um, which was a shame because it probably meant that I couldn't do necessarily all the opportunities available in those um three months summer breaks, which I really miss. Um. But what I often did is um, instead of going down the sort of perhaps corporate 12 week internship route is that I um, most of the work or activity or um, internships I did were about six weeks in length. So I would balance the six weeks unpaid internship with um, taking on more regular paid work for the rest of the summer. Obviously, I know everyone's diff I've got different backgrounds and experiences, so it really does depend. But I think um it's better to have some experience than no experience and I think you can learn at, um, a lot of the learning you can do in six weeks it might not be that drastically different from 12 weeks so um so yeah I would say don't don't be too disheartened if you don't get onto one of the sort of more corporate type internships available. I'd also say from a civil service perspective I, I don't actually think you really need like unpaid internships. It's very much like we don't really look at CVs, like the, the hiring process and the civil service is, is quite different in that aspect. So it, it's always about, you know, specific examples and cases of how you've shown a specific type of behaviour or, you know, that could be, you know, leadership or communicating um, effectively uh, and things like that. And I really think that, you know, you can get that experience from um, from paid work um, if you are sort of being strategic about the paid work you do and how you frame that paid work. Um, I think I really I think, you know, an internship in an, a relevant policy area might be like the cherry on top. But I really think like there are loads of opportunities to get into the civil service um, without that. And then 
you know, once you're in the civil service, it is also a lot easier to move around into like a policy area that you're perhaps more interested in. Um, so, it, it, yeah, if you're thinking about the civil service route, I, I genuinely wouldn't worry too much about it. It's just about having like the opportunities to have some some good examples of like key um, key skills, really, more than anything else. Uh, just to mention a very practical advice. So in Brussels, you do have a lot of a uh, lot of internships. Most of them are not well. Some are unpaid, but most of them are paid very low uh, salary. But you do get something. Uh, so it's always a good first step. It's it's obviously a bit difficult uh, to, to, to 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 start with this, such a low salary. But it's a good uh, it's a good way to get your fed foot on the door. Um, yeah. Uh, there's internships at, at the Parliament, at the European Commission, etc. They are, they are, they do offer some some payment. Yeah, because uh, this used to drive me completely mad. Um, not least because even if you can get a paid internship, if it's in London and it's six weeks and you don't live in London, that that is that is that is impossible. It was a nightmare. Um, so particularly if this is, I know it's something that causes you know quite a lot of worry, quite a lot of anxiety. Uh, I think as lots of people on this call have, have, have sort of outlined, think about the things you can do while you are at university during term and outside of it that mimic the skills you will get as work experience. So, you know, like um, I used to work for the admissions office. So love the sort of outreach volunteering side of that student hubs, the sort of student societies, you know, any of that. And again, as I sort of said earlier, like no one can stop you writing things and having your own writing out in your own name. So so that's a sort of another free thing you can do as well. So that sort of plea to, to I, th I think internships, obviously they give some competitive advantage, but but they are not the sort of be all and end all. And I definitely wasn't ever in a position where I could just sort of wander into London for six weeks on a living wage and wander back out again. <laughs> it seems to have gone okay so far. On the speculative applications, um, I've seen this both from an applicant side of the house and hiring manager side of the house. The words that come to mind are not kind and that's a waste of time. Um, <laughs> I wish you had a more diplomatic way of phrasing that, um, but it's really not worth it. From the, the applicant side of the house, it's effectively a black hole and you'd be much better off networking. Reach out to people on LinkedIn, go to networking events for this type of activity where there's an actual human being that goes, oh, care is a real person and they are looking for a job. From the hiring manager side of this, you might be wondering, okay then, why do speculative applications exist at all? Um, a lot of HR departments use these for kind of ghost recruiting type activities. We'll collect a lot of applications to see what type of skill sets they might be needing to develop or hire um, or what type of job salary ranges people might be expecting. So it's typically an HR benefit or an HR exercise as opposed to an actual outcome of hiring. Um, but I'll let others comment on the topic. And then on speculative applications, um, I think, you know, we are a essentially an SME, like we we have 40 staff, we get quite a few speculative applications. We have hired maybe one person because their application was brilliant. It was incredibly specific. They had networked with someone before that. They knew exactly what we did as an organisation. They knew what we were looking at. They had the skill set that we match, you know, they, they knew us as a company extremely well. Um, and, and that that is when it works. If you have, you know, I, I see sometimes people have lists of 100 organisations they've contacted with a cold email. Like that is a waste of time. <laughs> um, and, and again, as, as sort of Cara said to echo that, this is, this is about finding people that you like on LinkedIn, at events, at careers fairs and things. And and sort of going to them rather than sort of just say just scattergunning uh, things across, uh, which particularly if you're in a bit of a panic about finding an opportunity, can feel like a good use of time, uh, but probably isn't. So yeah, regarding speculative applications, I'm not sure if they're very effective. But uh, as Kara said, um, meeting with people is always is always good, it's always useful. You get some insights, you get some information. Uh, when I came uh, here first, I had a six month contract, so I wasn't sure if I was going to stay here longer or go back to Spain. And uh, I did reach out uh, to people I was uh, that I found interested in uh, just on LinkedIn. I sent them a message uh, saying, hey, I'm, I'm very interested in what you do at your, at your company or at your at your institution or or even in people uh, some people are very active on on social media about what they do and you just uh, show interest in what they what they do and uh, you you ask them you, you i had coffees with people with totally random people that i didn't know um yeah and just uh, 
they told me a bit their story, I told them mine, and I cannot say I got a job through that, but I can say, I, I, you know, you, you expand your network, you just learn things, and yeah, it's always useful, yeah. One thing I was just going to add based on um, what everyone else has said is that I think um, being in Cambridge provides you with so many networking opportunities. So there's like a million talks and like you could go to a different thing every night of the week, meet new people, get involved in all sorts of different societies. And I think that's, well, when I compare my Manchester experience to my Cambridge experience, that's quite a unique thing about Cambridge. So I think really do take advantage of like how the societies and the college system as well just has so many opportunities to go to talks and events and meet people and talk to people. So yeah, you're lucky, so make the most of it. I just say like in general as a sort of sector or industry that um we are quite lucky that there isn't one route in um and actually that is something that should be like really reassuring to everyone that um every anything you apply for any opportunity shouldn't have to feel as weighted because there will be a different one that comes along um so please don't put too much pressure on yourself um also i would say that once you're into the career um you just get in once you get onto the first run of the ladder things do get a lot easier and um, we're also in a generation and day and age where moving perhaps fairly frequently so once every 18 months two years for promotions for different experiences is um considered positive rather than anything else so once you're in you can get going with it um and don't be afraid to change your mind about what you want to do um because there's no point sticking at something just because you feel like is what you've always wanted to do or you feel like you should be doing it. You never know where you end up, so yeah. and good luck. I will heartily echo the sentiment of choose happiness um, and just say that if you if you want to send me a nasty gram, if I didn't answer your chat, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. If you want to schedule some time to just talk more about careers in the geopolitics slash corporate security slash intel field, I'm happy to do that. So um, don't be a stranger. My network is your network. And the only thing that I ask is that if you do reach out to me with either with an email or a meeting request, please come with one question, at least one question. Um, sometimes I get these calls and they're like, I just want to do what you do. And then they stare at me and I'm like, I don't know where to start with that. So come with one question and we'll build from there. Even if the question is what's on the menu, um, how much should I ask for salary wise? Happy to, to, to craft the conversation to fit your needs. I think I would also just, you know, echo that. I think I think networking and, and just trying to understand what what the work is is like or, or what might interest you. I think in you know, again, just speaking from a civil service perspective, there's so many opportunities. And I really feel like, you know, just starting somewhere in the civil service can like give you loads of opportunities to move across to different different areas. I really wouldn't be put off by a policy area just because it doesn't necessarily sound interesting um, from the get-go. I've worked in lots of different things at this point and there's always something exciting and something interesting going on and like ultimately you're learning a lot about the key policy skills that enables you to move across to, to a different policy area that you might perhaps be, be more interested in. So I'd really recommend being sort of quite open to to what specifically you end up working with if you're interested in, in the civil service because there are loads more opportunities once once you're you got your foot in the door um you don't have to like stay working on i don't know parking reform for three years you know there, there are other things out there there are many different skills that are needed in, in public affairs and policy making and, and my consultancy will have people uh yeah have studied the law international relations some people with the science background uh yeah more me history <clears throat> so yeah and all the skills that you learn in this uh at university in different different um studies are, are useful because uh, in the end also we advise clients in very different sectors um secondly um also in particular in the consulting world uh, once you you start in it you also get to learn a lot uh while while working you were learning about different sectors now i'm working transport sector last year i was working uh and yeah on the tech sector and some intellectual property issues um so yeah you, you get to learn a lot and then you can also decide where you want to go where, where, on what uh, you want to specialize and yeah uh, other than that uh, yeah good luck and uh, yeah i'm happy to to answer questions also uh, if you want on linkedin uh, afterwards yeah. 
I think um, my one thing would be, and, and this is is both a sort of reflection on on my time at Cambridge and now sort of interviewing people, particularly that have been been in and out of Cambridge. If you say in your application that you are really interested in policy and policy making and politics, and that we then ask you about it and you have no idea what's going on because you've been living in some sort of weird bubble reading a lot about the French Revolution, um, that is that is that is a bad reflection on you and not not on us. So there is an eye to all of this on on the outside world and what is going on, what are the what are the policy debates in the sort of country or sector that you want to work in. Uh, who is saying what what political party has gone mad this week you don't have to be a co- kind of complete politics person but I think you do have to have an eye in any of these sort of roles on on what's going on in, in the world around you and and that is sometimes missing uh, it's almost exclusively from our sort of Oxbridge applicants so uh, there you go. That, there's my there's my word of warning back uh, yeah read read the news <laughs> And I would build on that by saying podcasts are a really fun and easy way to do that. So I'll just give you another plug for lots of current affairs podcasts that are out there. Uh, So, yeah, I guess my one thing would just be to go for it, like just demonstrate enthusiasm that you want to, you know, you're a good person to work with. And ultimately, that's the most important thing. So, yeah, I think go for it view applications as experience um, try and get feedback whenever you can from people um, use your career service as well um, and yeah happy also to answer questions via email after this